Record. Hi, everyone, and welcome to week 15 of Coping with COVID. Um, we today are going over the PPP forgiveness application. Uh, so hopefully you've got your documentation ready so that we can walk through all of that together. Uh, today is Monday, July 6th, 2020, and I hope you are all doing well. Uh, we have started another new month. Now it is July, and it has been lovely, lovely seeing you weekly uh, since the end of March when we first started of these. Uh, it seems like it's been, uh, it's been a minute. As many of you know, uh, my name is Elaine. Uh, it is lovely to see you. Um, I am a CPA and I have a personal financial specialist and I'm an accredited financial counselor, all of which is to say uh, we can talk about money and budgeting and investments and taxes and maybe cry a little bit while we talk about all of those things. Um, I have been very much enjoying having these conversations with you. And when I'm not having coping with COVID conversations with you, I get to have similar conversations with amazing groups all around the country. Um, I am incredibly lucky to be doing this work and helping creative individuals and organizations with the business side of their creativity. Everything we do in these sessions is for educational purposes only. These rules are complicated and nuanced and they change on a fairly regular basis. Uh, but it, I do think it's important to kind of go through this information and make sure you have some support and some access to someone who's reading these information and all the regulations carefully. But remember, this is all for educational purposes only. So for today, we are reviewing the easy PPP forgiveness application. Um, after the most recent or second most recent legislation was passed, um, the covered period for the PPP forgiveness period was extended, which is great news. And there is a simplified application to apply for forgiveness. Remember, this PPP program is technically a loan that you may have applied for and received. And as long as you spend the loan on approved expenses and meet certain criteria, then you can apply for the loan to be forgiven, meaning you don't have to pay it back. So what we're going through today is the application to apply for forgiveness, which is the next step for many of you. So what I'd like you to do first is go ahead and get some stuff handy. Um, there are links on the uh, slides and in the chat uh, to access the form for the PPP Easy Forgiveness application. It's form 3508EZ and also the instructions to that form. Uh, keep them handy because they're going to be helpful as we go through this. Um, and the way I've essentially structured this is walking through the form uh, point by point, question by question, with some examples and some questions interspersed throughout that have come up from many of you. Um, as you're getting all of that information together, uh, take a deep breath, relax, it's going to be okay, I promise. As you are getting that information together as well, I would suggest if you've got a copy of your original application for the PPP loan, go ahead and have that handy. Um, if you did not save a copy of it, it's okay, it's not the end of the world. But if you have a copy of it, maybe go ahead and keep that handy. Um, and then also have access to your bank account, um, wherever the PPP funds were deposited, and then where you were spending them out of. See if you can go ahead and have access to that information as well because that'll help you kind of pull things together. Um, I have, I'm using Excel um, in a lot of the examples and I shared a link to a Google Sheet version of the little mini calculator I put together. Um, if it is not helpful, just ignore it. But if it is helpful for you, go ahead and save a copy of it and use it in whatever way makes sense for you. But when I'm saying Excel, I really do mean kind of any organized way of keeping your information. It doesn't have to be in Excel, although I happen to really, really love Excel. But if you are using a piece of paper and a highlighter and your bank statements, that is perfectly fine as well. Okay, so the first thing at the very top of the instructions to form 3508EZ, there are three criteria and you have to meet one of them to be allowed to use this, this EZ version of the PPP forgiveness application. Most of the individuals I work with qualify under the first criteria. They are self-employed and they have no employees. And that applies to many of the people who have been listening in on these web, web conversations or these webinars. You are self-employed and you have no employees. So sole proprietor, single member LLC, 
this is probably you, you're hanging out in this world. And as long as you meet that first criteria, you can use this very, very simplified application. A handful of you, um, including those of you who may have S corporations that pay yourself or other owners as employees, may qualify under the second or third criteria. The second criteria um, is that you maintained your salaries and the number of employees during the covered period. So if you are an S corporation and you are the only owner, um, you may not qualify under the first criteria if you're paying yourself a salary, right? Uh, because you would have a salary, obviously. If you're an S corporation and say you owe it with, uh, own it with a partner or uh, someone else in your life, right? Then if you're paying both of yourselves salary, again, you wouldn't qualify under that first criteria. But as long as you maintained the salary that you paid yourselves before things went crazy and you maintained the number of employees, then you can still qualify to use this application. And when I say maintained salary, um, according to the instructions, as long as you paid yourself 75% of your pre -un or pre PPP pandemic salary, that's totally fine. Now, for PPP purposes, you probably wanted to pay yourself at least that just to make sure all of the expenses were forgivable, but 75% of the salary is the threshold. Now, if you don't meet the first two criteria, then there's an opportunity to meet the third criteria. In this case, you have to maintain salaries, but you had to be legally required to shut down during the covered period. Um, this applies probably mostly to restaurants and bars, although it could also be theaters or museums or other places that were not able to uh, maintain the same number of people during, during the covered period because they were legally required to shut down. Again, 99% of the people probably qualify under that first criteria. A handful of individuals, particularly those with S corporations, probably qualify under either first, the first or the second, right? So most of the individuals in our world are gonna be dealing with this easy form. So for our example, let's pretend you're a self-employed creative individual and your net income from 2019 was 45,852. This is a real example that one of you provided me with, so I am very appreciative for that. This is the amount from line 31 of Schedule C from 2019, right? That's the net income from your business. This person applied for and received a $9,500 PPP loan, and they received the funds on May 15th of 2020, right? Those are kind of the first three pieces of information you need to have handy. And you probably have this information or have it very easily accessible. And I would suggest you plop it into that Excel workbook because a lot of this information is going to feed some of the future calculations. So here you can see we've got the PPP loan uh, amount, $9,500, the loan date, May 15th, that's the amount the dollars actually came into your bank account. So it's a different date than you would have applied for them or maybe been approved for them. We're looking at the date the funds actually arrived in your bank account, right? It's also possible some individuals received multiple disbursements of PPP funds. So maybe you got $8,000 on May 15th and then another $1,500 part of the same PPP application on May 22nd, right? We're looking at the first day that you got PPP dollars for that loan date, okay? And then I would suggest you keep your Schedule C line 31 number handy. I'd go ahead and put it at the top of that Excel file just so that it can automatically show you the weekly and the monthly amount because that's going to inform your disbursement and how you're accounting for the disbursements. So then you basically take that information and add it to your PPP forgiveness application. If you've got your original application, what you use to apply for the PPP loan, make sure this information is exactly the same. You're gonna have your business legal name, the address, your DBA or trade name if you have one, and then your EIN or social security number, and your phone and the primary contact information. Again, make this match your original application. So far, so good. This step is pretty easy. Then we move down a little bit on the application. They're asking for the PPP loan number, the lender's PPP loan number, the loan amount, and the disbursement date. 
we already know the loan amount and the disbursement date, right? You can look at that information from your bank account or from any of the paperwork you got from the lender. Hopefully, the lender's paperwork will also show the PPP loan number and possibly the lender's PPP loan number, but it's possible it doesn't. If it doesn't have either of those numbers, you can contact the lender and ask for that information. Now, that might cause you to shudder a little bit because who wants to be contacting the lender right now, right? Here's the thing though, you're gonna to have to contact them to submit this application to them. So at some point, you're probably gonna have contact with them. That's a really good time to ask them for that information if you can't put your fingers on it, right? Because it is definitely possible that it is not contained anywhere on your paperwork. Um, my gut says it's probably buried somewhere, but it may not necessarily be in a place that's easy for you to find. So contact the lender and see if you can get that information. Or if you don't want to do that, you just want to wait until you're ready to hand this over to the lender or fill it out on their website, then go ahead and do that. And that's okay as well. Okay. The next part of the application uh, asks for the number of employees you had at the time you applied. And then it asks for the number of employees you have right now. Again, it's really helpful if you have your original application for the PPP loan because you entered the number of employees at the top of that form. So you're going to probably put one if you were your own employee. You may even have put one and then parentheses myself or the owner or something like that. Put that number on this forgiveness application as well. We want them to match. And then the employees at the time of forgiveness if you are self-employed and just hanging out and it's still just you, then put that same number. Um, if you had employees, uh, one of the conditions of PPP is that you were maintaining them, right? So you want to go ahead and report the number of employees you have right now at the time you're applying for forgiveness as well. The next section is this EIDL advance amount and your EIDL application number. Um, you've probably seen floating around on social media uh, the idea that you know the SBA is giving away $1,000 to self-employed individuals, right? This is what they're talking about. This is that EIDL program. We've talked about it in previous weeks where you can apply for a loan. It is a loan from the SBA that is 3.75% uh, interest rate if you are a for-profit and it comes with an immediate advance that is treated as a grant. And the advance amount is based on the number of employees. So if you are self-employed, your advance would be $1,000 for yourself as the employee. Um, the advance does count against your PPP forgiveness. So you can have the $1,000 of EIDL advance, or you can have the $1,000 counted toward your PPP forgiveness amount. Either way is totally fine. But if you applied for EIDL, you probably have an application number. And if you got an advance, you need to go ahead and report that there as well. Um, a question, this person got a $2,000 advance um, and the PPP is less than $2,000. Does that mean PPP is not forgivable? Um, that's a really good question. Um, possibly. It might mean your PPP is not forgivable. Um, I would look at the names that we're filing because it's possible that um, maybe it's the business or the S corporation that applied for PPP and then uh, maybe an individual that applied for EIDL. So if we're talking about different entities or different names on those applications, it should be fine. Um, but if your EIDL advance was more than the PPP, uh, yes, your PPP is probably not forgivable. Uh, so that means uh, we might think about how we're going to make sure to pay that back. Um, it looks like it's about a $1,500 amount. The next part after the EIDL amount is a payroll schedule. So we're looking at weekly, biweekly, twice a month, monthly, or some other amount. 
for many individuals. Uh, when we were originally going through this, you chose to start paying yourselves monthly. That's what I would check, right? If you wanted to pay yourself weekly, you are welcome to check that as well. But for the purpose of the covered period, you need to maintain some sort of consistent payment to yourself. Right. So um, I think weekly or monthly is the easiest way to do it just from a math perspective, but you know your numbers best. Then we get to talk about this covered period. This covered period is basically the period of time that is covered by the PPP loan that you received. Right. So originally the PPP loans had an automatic eight week covered period. So in our example for this person that received the loan on May 15th, May 15th plus eight weeks would get them to uh, July 10th of 2020. So that would be their covered period. That's the amount of time that they had to expend the funds on qualified expenses. However, with the flexibility that was introduced in later legislation, the covered period was extended to a six month period instead of an eight week period. This is really important for self-employed individuals because as long as you choose the six month covered period, you are allowed to pay yourself up to two and a half months worth of your 2019 Schedule C line 31 number. Remember, that's the number you used when you applied for PPP, right? So now you can pay yourself up to that amount as long as you choose the six month covered period. If you choose the eight week covered period, which you are allowed to do if you received your PPP dollars before June 5th, you can choose that eight week period. If you choose that period, you can only pay yourself eight weeks worth of your um, Schedule C line 31 amount. Um, question in the chat, is it six months or 24 weeks? I think those are the same. Um, the uh, guidance on the instructions calls it 168 days. So it's six, four, six months with four weeks each or 24 weeks, um, which in theory should be close to the same. Uh, but as we know, they're never exactly the same. Uh, I'm pretty sure the instructions say 168 days. So I think they're doing it uh, 24 weeks times seven days per week to get to that number. For most individuals, you will have run out of funds before you get to 24 weeks, right? Most people are running out of funds after about 10, 11, 12 weeks, depending on the timing of the funds. Um, so you definitely want to choose the longer period, six months or 24 weeks, because you want to be able to pay yourself the maximum amount, uh, because you don't want to have the amount that you can pay yourself capped at just your eight weeks of your Schedule C line 31 average amount. In the Excel workbook, there's a little formula that will sort of do the math to count out the covered period for you. You are welcome to use Excel to use this and add the days, or you can look at a calendar and count out the weeks as well. But in either case, on your application, your covered period starts on the day you received the funds. So in our example, that's May 15th, and then it goes through six months or 24 weeks later, because you definitely want the longer covered period. There is an opportunity for something called an alternative payroll covered period. So this would definitely make sense if you have employees, right? So if you're an S corporation and you are running payroll regularly for yourself, um, you may want to think about the alternative payroll covered period. If you are a self-employed sole proprietor, it probably doesn't make sense for you to think about this. But this alternative period allows you to shift the starting date of your covered period so it perfectly coincides with your pay period. But you can only do that if you're on a weekly or bi-weekly payroll schedule already, right? So let's pretend you have an S corporation and you pay yourself and your partner uh, a salary from that S corporation, but you pay yourselves monthly you wouldn't be allowed to shift to this alternative payroll cover period. You can only do that if you have the weekly or bi-weekly amount. 
again, for most individuals, this probably doesn't necessarily need to happen, right? Because if you received the funds, then you can start dispersing them as it makes sense for you. Then the last question in sort of this intro section is uh, if your PPP loan is more than $2 million, you have to check that little box. Okay, so that's sort of all the start of the general information, right? The gathering of the data kind of information where you enter just the preliminary stuff. Then we get into the numbers. And here would be my suggestion. Instead of just putting them right on the application, uh, go to Excel or wherever you're tracking your expenses and kind of put them together, right? Um, what I would look like or what I would look at is how much money did you get and then how did you spend it? And so what I would do is on each date that you either paid yourself, I'd call that owner's draw, or you paid another qualified expense, so rent or utilities, go ahead and track those payments in some sort of organized way. I also like tracking the expenses by column because that makes it easy to then take the numbers and put them right on the application uh, for forgiveness, right? Um, question in uh, the chat. Um, this person has fully paid myself at this point based on the original eight weeks. Um, that is totally fine. So what I would do is just list out all the dates of those original eight weeks and then write down how much you paid yourself during each of those weeks. Um, so that's, that's how I would do it. In theory, many people have probably fully uh, paid themselves at this point. There's another question in the chat about whether there's a blank form available. Uh, no, I should have added that as a second tab. Uh, when I email this out afterwards, I'll go ahead and put a blank form on there too for you to uh, play with. But also feel free to just delete all the numbers that are there if that's helpful. So what you need to do is kind of get a handle on where the money went by category. And remember, the allowable expenses are payroll, including paying yourself, uh, rent on business property, utilities on business property. And then if you own business property, uh, you could have mortgage interest that's allowable as well. Um, as part of this as well, the instructions suggest very strongly that you maintain documentations for this, all of these expenses, right? And so what they suggest that you have to document is some sort of certification around payroll. So this can be uh, what you paid yourself. You can just keep a list of that. You can show transfers from your bank account if that works for you. Um, if you write yourself checks, you can do that too, right? However you're showing the payments, that's what you want to do. You also want to note that the amount you're paying yourself or your employees is not less than 25% of your normal salary. And if you're basing the amount that you're paying yourself on your 2019 Schedule C line 31 amount, either monthly or weekly, you're totally fine and you're allowed to do that. They also suggest that you maintain uh, the certifications around the number of employees you had. If it's just you, that's really easy. But if there are other humans involved, you wanna make sure that you are tracking payroll to them, of course, uh, but then also if they resign or if they are fired for cause or if you try to get them to keep working and they would prefer not to, definitely maintain documentation of all of those things. Again, if it's just you, you had one person before, one person now, that's pretty straightforward. They also ask that you retain documentation about the impact of COVID on your operations, right? So um, what you basically may be asked to show is that you would be unable to operate or you were unable to operate during the covered period, so that period of time when you expended the funds, at the same level that you normally would. So how could you show that? Uh, if you have emails showing canceled projects or canceled events, or um, if you uh, were planning to participate in something that was canceled, uh, if productions were canceled, kind of whatever your normal disruptions have been, if you have documentation showing that, that's not a bad thing to hang on to in your files. You could also think about 
looking at what you earned in 2019 during the same period and what you earned in 2020. Um, and it's possible the amount in 2020 is lower. You could certainly save that as documentation as well. But you know, as a gut check, kind of what things were canceled. So if you have external sort of confirmation or corroboration of that, definitely save that, hang on to it. Or if you just kind of keep a list of projects that you know were canceled, that can certainly help as well. They also want documentation kind of proving the expenses you incurred. So this would be uh, transfers to your landlord for rent payments, um, checks, canceled checks, copies of utility bills, um, anything that shows what you spent the money on will be helpful in terms of documentation. I know some people are using funds to pay for home office or home studio rent and utility expenses as well. I would use the percentage calculation from your form 8829 that shows the percentage of space you used for your business as a percentage of your whole home. I would use that as a good kind of gut check for what percentage you're essentially kind of reimbursing yourself for your home utilities, for example. Um, that stuff is just good to kind of hang on to. You do not have to submit any of that information with this application but the SBA or your lender may ask for it, right? So gather it, keep it handy, keep copies of it in a place that's easy for you to find later, but don't worry about actually submitting it when you apply for forgiveness, just keep it handy. The last documentation they suggest that you maintain uh, are any records regarding this PPP process. So that would be a copy of the application if you've got it, copy of any communications from the lender, copy of the forgiveness application if you've got that, that could be good. Um, calculations you may have done. If you're tracking your expenses in Excel, save that, or Google Sheets or a piece of paper, right? Save that. Um, if you have made choices based on articles you've read, like the choice to pay yourself on a weekly basis and expend all of your PPP funds, save copies of those articles, right? You may not ever need them, but it's good to kind of have them handy. Uh, if the lender has given you any information, um, so maybe they gave you a packet of information or uh, contact information of someone, you know, or a stack of paperwork, save all that, keep it handy. And then if you have a bank statement that shows the PPP funds coming in and then whatever you expended it on, keep all that information handy as well. Again, many of you are already doing this, right? So this is just a matter of knowing where to get the information quickly if you need it. And also, if you want to save a second copy in a special PPP folder somewhere, that might not be a terrible idea. You do have to maintain these records for six years following forgiveness, right? So let's pretend you apply for forgiveness and then you actually get forgiveness, say in September or October of this year, that's when your clock would start and you would need to maintain these records for six years. That's a long time. You're probably keeping your tax records for about that long anyway, but five years from now, hopefully you will have no memories of this PPP process. So if you've got everything handy, that means if you do get audited at some point in the future, you don't have to worry about it. There are two extra uh, little sections on this template I want to draw your attention to. Um, the columns at the right show the PPP funds you have spent. And this workbook is designed to so that that is a cumulative total. So every time there's a, an amount entered on one of those lines, it'll automatically add up so that you can see kind of the running total of what you've spent. And then the PPP remaining column takes the original PPP amount minus what you've spent and then shows you what is still left to spend, right? Then at the very bottom, you'll have these totals here that show what you spent by category, which makes it relatively easy to transfer this information onto the application for forgiveness. 
So this is a copy of the example we put together. Um, so for this person, uh, they received their funds on May 15th. They decided to pay them uh, weekly, um, pay themselves weekly. So then they've got this owner's draw amount sort of going through. And then they paid their landlord $550 on June 1st. And then they had a utility bill that they paid on June 4th. So you can see these PPP funds uh, slowly growing, right? That's the amount of PPP that has been spent on allowable expenses. And then this column shows the amount of remaining PPP funds. So this takes that 9,500 minus what this person has spent and you can see it getting all the way down to zero. I have sort of jiggered this uh, to show fully spending the funds um, and making them go to zero. So essentially forcing them to go to the zero um, with this last week of payroll. You'll see in the week of July 13th, they paid themselves this amount or they will pay themselves that amount. Um, and then that means at the end of that week, they'll have $231 left. So obviously, if they want to pay themselves the full payroll amount for the next week, that's perfectly fine, but not all of that will be forgiven because that'll be more than their PPP amount. So if you are someone who is intentionally paying yourself and spending down PPP, go through this exercise just to kind of calculate what you're paying yourself to make sure it's all well and good and covered, right? Uh, if you are someone who is just continuing to pay yourself, right, your sheet might look like this, where in that week of July 20th, you just pay yourself, again, $881 as normal, right? So then you'll see that your PPP uh, is greater than the original loan amount, but that's okay, right? The application is designed to kind of solve for that issue, so it's not a huge deal. If you are someone who wanted to pay yourself monthly, you have to do a little bit of extra finagling at the beginning uh, of the PPP period, depending on when during the month you typically pay yourself. So this gets a little bit funky, right? So stick with me. It sort of makes logical sense, but getting to the math part sometimes takes a hurdle or two. So remember, in our example, this person got their PPP funds on May 15th, right? And then they decided they wanted to pay themselves monthly at the end of each month. So they used the monthly amount that they calculated on the application, and that came out to be $3,821. But here's the thing. They, told, they paid themselves $3,821 on May 31st, probably, but that included the entire month of May, but they only had PPP covered period starting on May 15th. So what we have to do is essentially prorate that owner's draw amount or that compensation amount so that we figure out the amount that they paid themselves from May 15th through the end of May, rather than uh, for the entire month, which I hope kind of makes sense, right? For PPP purposes, you can't use PPP dollars before you actually got them. So you have to start your PPP payroll calculation no earlier than the day you got the funds. So we did that fairly simply. We basically just took a ratio here. 16 days of PPP coverage during the month of May, 14 days without, right? If you wanted to be very precise and use 31 days in the month instead of 30, that's okay too. We're sort of an ish world it's perfectly fine, right? So we took the total payroll amount for the month, multiplied it by the number of days as a ratio, and that's how we figured out that for PPP purposes, during the covered period, this person paid themselves $2,037.87 from PPP funds in May. Then they had their regular rent and utilities, just like they had if they were doing the weekly calculation, and then the regular June amount. And then we see in July, they didn't have PPP funds to pay themselves the full amount again. So we just kind of zero out the payroll for July for what they paid themselves. So hopefully that kind of makes sense. If you're doing weekly, just go weekly, it's totally fine. If you're doing monthly and you happen to get your PPP funds on the first day of the month, you don't have to prorate, right? Because it's fully covered. But if you're in sort of a weird situation, right, you might want to think about some prorating and, and that's okay. 
ultimately this is just a timing thing because you have 24 weeks to use the funds so they will all get used it's just a matter of kind of accounting for when they got used okay a question that came in via email was about rent and utilities but for a home office um, so there are a couple things to think about if that's your situation First of all, you want to make sure you had a home office expense on your Schedule C. So what we would be looking for is on line 30. You've gotten really used to line 31, that's the net income amount, but now look a little bit higher at line 30 on your Schedule C. If you had a number there, then that means that you or your accountant claimed an expense for home office in 2019 you're good to go. You also probably have a form 8829 that was attached to your tax form as well. If you did not have a number on line 30 of your 2019 Schedule C, then you can't use home office expenses um, as allowable PPP funds, right? Um, unless you have a very specific situation uh, that we can talk about offline. But as a general rule, if you didn't have that expense in 2019, you can't claim it uh, as a PPP allowable expense in 2020. And for some people, this was a little confusing because if you are an individual that itemizes your uh, deductions on Schedule A, you may have deducted your home mortgage interest there on Schedule A. That doesn't count though. We're only looking at if you had home mortgage interest deduction on Schedule C or a home office deduction on Schedule C. So I know that's kind of confusing, but we're trying to keep the focus in business world on this. So as long as you had it in 2019, you're totally good to go. And as I mentioned, I would probably rely on the percentage allocation from 2019 and apply that to any expenses you're paying right now to support your home office expense. Okay, another question that came in was, what if you accidentally spent money on the wrong things? Um, and as you know, the rules have been in flux and changing and there has been conflicting guidance. So this might be very possible. Um, the person that raised the question used some of the PPP funds to pay for their own health insurance um, and other sort of employment benefits. Now, if you were an employee, that would be allowed, but as someone who's self-employed, that is not an allowable expense. So if you spent the money on what we now know is a disallowed expense, you may think about paying it back and spending it on something that is allowed. Now, when I'm talking about paying it back, I don't mean pay it back to the bank. I mean kind of pay it back to yourself. And then in accounting world, whether it's in your Excel sheet or something else, show that you're spending those dollars on an allowable expense instead of a disallowed expense. And if you now have a 24 week period to think about, you probably have enough time to um, include an extra rent payment or maybe more utility payments or pay yourself an additional weekly or monthly amount to go ahead and use those dollars. In accounting world, we talk about this idea of cash being fungible, which means, you know, dollars go where they go and you can't necessarily track the exact dollar of where it's going. So if you happen to spend some amount of money on a disallowed expense, right, think about not allocating fungible PPP dollars for that expense and ex instead accounting for that using allowable expenses. If it's an allowable expense, but it's more than you wanted to spend, say um, maybe you paid yourself in payroll uh, at a higher amount or um, rent or utilities, right? All of those are allowable expenses. It's probably fine, right? Uh, there's a sort of fix on the forgiveness application that will sort of suss things out as long as you're still meeting that 60% test, meaning, 60% of the PPP funds have to be spent on payroll. So as long as you are clearing that threshold, you should be totally fine. Um, I received a question in the chat about um, 
the line 30 amount. So would you put in those line 30 numbers even if you just paid yourself? So if you spent your PPP funds entirely on paying yourself, nope, you do not have to worry about that line 30 amount. Uh, you would leave all your rent uh, and home office and utility numbers blank, right? And that is perfectly fine. Okay. So once we know kind of where the money went, right, then we start looking at making sure we meet the requirements for forgiveness, right? And in a perfect world, if we had all these guidelines at the very beginning, we could have planned perfectly for those expenses, but that's not the world we live in. So I like the idea of just listing out what the actual expenses were and then let's make sure we're meeting the standards for forgiveness and allocating PPP dollars to the right thing. So the first threshold is that you have to spend at least 60% of the funds on payroll. At least 60% of the funds have to be spent on payroll. The next test is whether payroll, so the actual amount you paid yourself, is less than two and a half months of your Schedule C line 31 amount, right? It has to be less than that. I suppose it could be equal to that as well, right? But equal or less than that amount. And that is only if you choose the 24 week covered period. If you're choosing the eight week covered period, then you, your payroll has to be less than eight weeks of your Schedule C line 31 amount, right? Which remember is less than what you applied for originally. So choose the 24 week covered period and make sure what you paid yourself is less than that amount. And then the third test is, is what you paid yourself less than $20,833? Uh, for many of you, it probably will be, right? Because it is based on your Schedule C line 31 amount being $100,000 or less. Then after you've gone through all that, you add the numbers from your Excel sheet to the form. But before we do that, um, I have another question in the chat. This question says, what if my original numbers were based on an earlier Schedule C number that was higher than the one actually submitted to the IRS? Totally fine. Here's what I would say. Um, in that case, if you have, you okay, so the payroll threshold for you, let me go back to that slide, um, is still going to be 2.5 months of the Schedule C you actually submitted to the IRS, right? So that means they gave you more funds um, than you were technically eligible for, uh, but that's probably fine. So the forgiveness is going to be based on the actual Schedule C you submitted to the IRS. So if you had other expenses, so maybe you had a home mortgage, uh, you could allocate that extra $500 to you know, business rent or utilities, um, then you could get them still forgivable. If you didn't have any other expenses that are allowable, uh, then you might be in a situation where that 500 bit is not forgivable, uh, but everything else is. Okay, so then we add all of um, the numbers to the Schedule C. Uh, sorry, not to the Schedule C, to the forgiveness application, right? So then it shows us payroll, business mortgage, rent or lease, business utilities, right? Forgive the ugliness of this example, but you basically take the numbers from your Excel sheet and then put them onto the form, right? So the payroll costs, that's from this owner's draw column. And for this person, it was $8,166.96. Uh, they didn't have business mortgage interest, but they did have rent payments of $1,100 and utility payments of $233.04, right? So you just take one number from the Excel sheet and put it on the forgiveness application. There was a clarifying question um, in the chat. Uh, for an S corporation, you would not have a Schedule C. Uh, you may have a Schedule E, though. Um, and so for your Schedule E, 
and or the K-1 you probably received from the S Corporation, uh, what you are probably looking for is an actual uh, business mortgage payment or a business lease payment. Um, so you can see if that's captured on your K-1 or on your Schedule E. Uh, and if not, then I would look for Form 8829 to see if that's included. Um, and if neither of those are options, then you probably may not have had home office claimed through the business. You may have claimed it through your personal tax return. Um, but if you want to dive in and take a peek, uh, we can certainly do that. So you've got payroll costs rent or lease or mortgage interest and then utility payments you just plop them onto the form and then for line five it says okay now add up all of those numbers you add them up and lo and behold they end up being exactly the ppp amount because in our example this person wanted to expend the ppp funds if they continued to pay themselves payroll then they would just include whatever additional payroll was in um, this covered period amount and then on line six, you put your total PPP amount, right? So in the example earlier where the total PPP amount may have been more than what's forgivable, right? Uh, what would happen is on this line eight, you would naturally enter the lowest number. So that's how that extra $500 for that person might end up being unforgivable unless they had uh, another expense they could put that extra $500 to. And then when we get to line seven, they're calculating this in a slightly backwards way from the way my brain works. So I wanted to kind of walk through it with you. On line seven, this is where they're asking about the payroll cost 60% requirement. Again, the funds have to be spent at least 60% on payroll. So the way they're getting to that, they're asking you to go back to line one, which is your payroll cost. So this is what you actually paid yourself during the covered period. And they want you to take that number and then divide it by 0 0.60 to get the amount um, or the maximum amount, right? So the payroll cost 60% requirement ends up being $13,611.60. This is sort of irrelevant uh, as long as you are underneath that threshold, uh, which is totally fun, totally fine. Uh, there's a question in the chat. Can the funds be spent 100% on payroll? Yes, they may be spent 100% on payroll. The thing is, the reason you might still be hearing different things is we still have that requirement, I'm going to go back to it, that the forgivable amount, so your payroll amount, has to be less than two and a half months of your Schedule C line 31 amount. So in this example, this person um, applied for PPP and they got $9,500, which was almost exactly 2.5 times their Schedule C line 31 amount. Very early on, I heard from at least one person who, based on his Schedule C, he should have been eligible for about an $1,800 PPP loan. That's just taking line 31 divided by 12 times 2.5, should have been about $1,800, but his bank actually gave him $2,000. And at first, that was very exciting because that was very, very nice, right? But all of a sudden, he had more money than he was allowed to spend on payroll. So in his situation, his payroll has to still be capped at that $1,800 amount. And as long as he has rent or utility payments, he can put that extra to, the whole thing is still forgivable. But if the amount that you got was based on two and a half months of your Schedule C and not anymore, then 100% can be spent on your payroll. And that's totally fine. So after we get line five, line six, and line seven out of the way, there's the total actual cost you had, the PPP loan in total, and then the 60% of payroll calculation. Line, says, line eight says, okay, what's the lowest of those three numbers, right? For this person, it's gonna be $9,500, right? So that's the amount that goes here. That is the amount that is eligible for forgiveness. Right? So the form is designed to kind of walk you through the tests, but essentially that's how it works. That's the meat of the form. That is the most difficult part of the form. Then you get to page two 
It asks you to initial and sign a whole lot of certifications that you have probably read repeatedly by now, and then you submit it to the lender. And then they say, hooray, it's forgiven, or no, it's not, we need additional information. Either way is perfectly fine. In our example, this person probably will have submitted their application um, by, you know, the end of July after they would have expended the, these dollars and then they may have received notification or will receive notification in August or September that the amounts are forgivable. That means they don't have to pay them back. So then remember, they have to save all these records for six years. So then they would save them until August or September of 2026. One clarifying piece that came out is that you do not have to wait until the end of the covered period to apply for forgiveness. This is really good news because for this person and for most of us, by the end of July, you will have spent all of your PPP dollars. So if you have to wait for 24 weeks before you apply for forgiveness, that's a lot of time you're just sitting there and your loan is just accruing interest. So thankfully, you can go ahead and apply for forgiveness as soon as you have expended the funds. It is possible though that your lender is not ready to receive your forgiveness application yet, that's okay. Be patient with them, right? They will get there, it's been released, the instructions are out, the clarifying guidance is out, it should probably be okay. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised if they start accepting the applications in the next couple weeks or so. Um, question going back a smidge, um, the question was, can I go over the forgivable amount one more time? Absolutely. So in this line 5678 part of the form, remember on one, two, three, and four, we had our payroll costs, the rent, the utilities, we had all those numbers, right? And then on line five, this is where they basically figure out what's the amount that's forgivable. Line five says, okay, what did you actually spend? So this is when you add up all of the actual expenses you had from your Excel sheet during that covered period. Then line six says, okay, how much did you borrow? What was your PPP loan amount? So then you would put the maximum or the PPP amount you actually got on line six. In this example, the person intentionally spent down the full PPP loan amount and did not spend any additional dollars during the covered period. If they continued to pay themselves, they may have had additional payroll costs, and that's totally fine. But for this person's sake, these two numbers are exactly the same. And then this weird line seven payroll cost requirement makes sure that the amount you're spending on payroll, so for this person, it was 8,160, almost $7. They divide that by 0 0.60. So that means this is the amount they would have had to borrow. Um, and so, so then, uh, this would be the maximum amount they could have borrowed to spend what they spent on payroll. That's a confusing way to say that. But this amount, let me say this different, $13,611.60 is the maximum PPP they could have borrowed to still meet that 60% on payroll requirement. Now, the lender wouldn't have given them that because the maximum they would have given them was about $9,500, right? So this line seven, is probably just a math exercise for most of you because it's going to be more than what you actually spent and what you actually got. So then on line eight, we say, okay, what is the forgiveness amount? It's going to be less than that. Um, question, clarifying question in the chat. This person says that number is nearly 50% of the actual loan, um, which doesn't seem to make sense. So if we go back to your payroll cost um, and the amount you paid yourself during the covered period, then we want to divide that by 0.6, which should be an amount that's about twice as much um, of what you actually got. Um, and if that's not the case, um, maybe after this, we'll dig into the numbers together, kind of just to see what's going on. Um, 
I happen to know this person and know that uh, that's a weird result. So that doesn't necessarily make sense. So yeah, the forgiveness amount looks at the lowest of these three numbers. Then you've got all your documentation, you're saving them for however long you need to save everything, and then you should be done. That should be it. And that's what we did today. Hopefully you had some time and you completed the PPP forgiveness application, or at least got a really good start to kind of walk through the numbers. Um, there are a handful of questions that came in via email that uh, some of them I touched on earlier uh, before we officially started, but I will officially answer them in next week's webinar. And if you have additional questions, send them my way. We'll put them into the Q&A next Monday. That's July 13th. And then at the end of July, we are taking an official summer break. So there will be no Q&A on July 20th or 27th, but then we will reconvene in early August, right around the time all that extra $600 per week unemployment is running out and new jobs numbers are coming out and everything continues to be um, delightfully insane, hopefully. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and close us out officially today. I hope you are doing well. I hope this was helpful. I hope you are staying safe and staying healthy, especially those of you who are living in areas where there have been additional flare-ups. I'm thinking about you and wishing you well. Bring all of your questions next Monday uh, because as you kind of percolate on this, I suspect you may have additional questions and we can go through them all next week on Monday, July 13th. I appreciate all of you so much uh, and I'll close us out and then stick around for a couple of questions offline. Thank you very much.